Well, I'm delighted to have another special guest at Kiev Post. Uh, this is Professor Charles Cockell, who is Professor of Astrobiology at the University of Edinburgh. And I have to add that uh, Professor Cockell has uh, graced the pages of uh, Kiev Post with his uh, philosophical contributions, uh, adding discussion and depth and context to uh, what we've been writing about the war, democracy, uh, values in this uh, complex world in which we live. Welcome, Charles. Thank you very much, Bowden. It's a, it's a privilege to be back here in Kiev. And I should say the, the twin city of Edinburgh. I didn't know that. Oh, the capital we, of Scotland. We, we were twinned in, in those heady days of the late 1980s with all the yes. changes. And so it's, uh, there's a natural connection there between the city I come from and, and Kiev. Okay, so the obvious question is, what brings you to Kiev? Yes, I'm here um, co-chairing a, a meeting that we've set up. We set it up about two months ago in the field of astrobiology. Astrobiology is a field that looks at the origin of life, how life got started on this planet, uh, how it's persisted for billions of years, and whether it might exist elsewhere. Uh, this is a field of science that sounds new, but in fact it has traditional roots from science uh, many decades ago. So Vernadsky, who was the first president of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, he wrote a book in the late 1920s called The Biosphere, and he popularized this idea that life takes over a planet and begins to direct the, the atmosphere and the oceans and the general conditions for life. So this idea of looking at life on a planetary scale, thinking about it uh, beyond the Earth, has a long history. And in this meeting, we've brought together the main astronomical observatory, that's the astro part, with the Institute for Molecular Biology and Genetics, which is the bio part, uh, both of those being institutions of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. And we've also brought together the, the Space Research Council of the Academy and the Ukrainian Astronomical Association. So we're two days in, you have two more days to go. And it's been a very exciting, thrilling meeting. Okay, Charles, uh, I'm glad you mentioned Vernadsky because you know, the Russians have always claimed him as a great Russian scientist. But he was, in fact, the first director of the Ukrainian uh, Academy of Sciences back yes. in 1919 or 18. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, now, uh, and incidentally, I mean, there are many other people uh, in the space sphere linked in some way to Ukraine, and as, for example, uh, some of the American scientists, uh, Carl yes. Sagan, whose parents came from Lviv. Mm. Mm. But let's get back to the uh, subject matter. Okay, this sounds very interesting, but why now, during war, are you discussing this in Kyiv? Yes, I think that, that's an extraordinarily important question. Some people might say, why are you talking about you know, life on other planets in wartime? I think there are two things to say about that. Um, first of all, science, a little bit like uh, art and literature, is something that we need to keep going whatever the conditions, political conditions. And I think that I would say that those of us who, who wish to, to fight for a civilization, of course I mean Ukraine, but I mean more broadly as well. Anyone who believes in building civilization wants to build a society where people can think about scientific questions, which could include, is their life elsewhere, but it could include many other scientific questions. So it's important that, um, that science continues to operate in these environments. In fact, one could say that the, uh, the situation of war is even more of a reason to maintain the, the focus and interest in scientific questions to emphasize the fact that we, we don't let go of our humanity and our interest in these situations. The second point I would make is probably a more, uh, a broader political philosophical point, that science is, is an activity that requires for its success an environment of being able to criticize your, uh, your seniors, to be able to bring up new ideas, challenge the status quo, uh, think about new paradigms. The, the whole of science is constructed... Almost like the press, the free press. Exactly. It's exactly the same um, requirement. In all, it's a, a, a free environment for ideas. And science depends on this to be successful. And it's no coincidence, I think, that in the 17th century, when the scientific method first emerged, and over the last uh, three centuries or so, the success of science and its discoveries and, and the application of those discoveries in technology has happened contemporaneously with the, uh, the development and emergency of liberal democratic ideas. Liberal democratic societies also require environments where people can think 
um, and, and come up with new ideas. So although we like to keep science separate from politics, it's undeniable that a good scientific environment is fundamentally a free environment. But yeah, we, we remember Newton, we remember the Enlightenment, and the, the, philosophs, uh, the philosophs were interested in exactly. science, weren't they? Yes, they were. The age of reason and the, the age of science and truth, not as defined by uh, priests, yes. but as defined yes. by facts. Exactly, and to pursue those ideas and to be able to challenge ideas, you require an environment where you can feel free to, to express ideas and challenge what people are already saying. So, so that's the second reason why I think that even in time of war, especially in time of war, we should pursue the ideas of, of a free scientific civilization. Charles, and what kind of reputation does Ukraine hold in the scientific world? I mean, it was strong in the Soviet period and the Soviet science, as it was then called, but independent Ukraine, uh, with all the weaknesses, economic weaknesses, corruption, whatever, what kind of reputation has it managed to uh, cling to or, or develop? Well, of course, present-day Ukraine uh, has a scientific reputation that's based on a very strong heritage. So I've mentioned Vernadsky. We could mention um, Winograsky, who, who uh, studied microorganisms and their role in, in the biosphere. In Korolev. Exactly, Rockets. Korolev as well. So, uh, of course, there was the development of science and technology during that Soviet era, but that was also constructed on uh, a long heritage that goes back to the uh, foundation of the Ukrainian uh, National Academy of Sciences. Today... Uh, Ukraine has strong interests from biology to astronomy, otherwise we wouldn't be able to have a meeting here where we're bringing together astronomers and biologists to think about scientific questions at that interface. And as an example, scientists in the uh, Institute for Molecular Biology and Genetics have launched experiments to the International Space Station in collaboration with their colleagues that are in the European astrobiology uh, community, the European astrobiology uh, society, if you like. So these are very recent developments in the last few years. Uh, so there's a great deal of interest in trying to expand that. Uh, Ukrainian scientists have also developed CubeSats, these miniature satellites that have recently been launched to space. So there's huge potential. And, and Robert Zubrin, when he was here, was saying, you know, this is a war uh, in which science is so highly visible. He's talking about uh, the, uh, the war conducted from the air, not just missiles, but drones, for example, yes. reconnaissance, intelligence gathering, and that the, it has, science uh, has changed the nature of warfare. Yes, uh, and I suppose there's always been that aspect of science that's strongly uh, embedded within, uh, within warfare and, and the outcomes of those sorts of situations. So there's a, you know, science has a complicated history. So we, we talk about a free scientific environment, which is what one might want to fight for. Of course, science also underpins the efforts. And have you felt from your Ukrainian colleagues that they're open and they're, they're as, as free in their expression as you in, in the West, in Edinburgh and elsewhere are? Absolutely, I do. And I think this is a characteristic of international science in general. Uh, all scientists want to have this environment where they can discuss ideas. Part of it is having the opportunity to do that, which is, again, why meetings like the one we're having here in Kiev are important, because it provides, even if just for a few days, uh, an environment to disconnect, perhaps, from some of the raw realities for a while and think about scientific questions as an international community. We've had scientists come in by uh, Zoom and discuss their work from across Edinburgh, uh, from across um, Europe, rather, and also um, further afield. Well, Scotland's also part of Europe. <laughs> yes, yes I, mean, I mean, not just Edinburgh. But it wants to be even <laughs> more integrated. Exactly. Well, let's not go down that path. That's politics. a whole other conversation. Right. Look, um, tell, yes. me, tell me, you, you say you were back here, you were here in 2017. Yes, I was. Have you yes. noticed any changes other than the war? Well, obviously the war, but, but I think that um, one of the things I have noticed is uh, I would say more of a, a, a self-conscious appreciation of Ukraine's potential in science and technology. I think we all take our own situations for granted in times of peace, simply because we just get on with our lives and we don't really think about what we value and what is important to defend. And I think when you do have to stand up for that, and it, it's, it's threatened with such serious uh, potential outcomes, it intensifies the interest in maintaining um, the health and vitality of those areas of acti activity and science is, is no exception. And, and what I have noticed is that there is enormous enthusiasm amongst Ukrainian scientists to develop collaborations, to expand collaborations and to continue making sure Ukraine is embedded within the 
the international world scientific community. And that's why it's so exciting to yeah. be here and try and uh, encourage these efforts. Charles, what I really like as the chief editor about your contribution is that your combination of science and political philosophy, the in-depth thinking about what are we about, where are we heading. Mm -hmm. If you were to pick two or three thoughts, mm -hmm. subjects that you've highlighted in your various articles for uh, Kiev Post and elsewhere, what would they be? I think briefly two things. I think that the Western world needs to be less embarrassed about its past. <laughs> there have been obviously um, uh, periods in Western history such as colonialism that have not been good, but we should not confuse that with the fundamental developments of accountable government, freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, equality before the law. These are astounding developments over the last few hundred years, and we have to separate those from the no more negative aspects of our history and believe in them and, and stress them to the world uh, m with more confidence. So that's the first point I would make. I think the second point I would make is that um, we tend to think along a similar line that the sorts of things I've just discussed are Western values. And certainly people that wish to uh, undermine these ideas describe them as Western values or Western imperialism. The idea of, for example, equality before the law, being treated equally uh, with all other citizens and not being um, uh, pursued by the state for particular political ideas. This is not a Western value. It's a good idea. It's, I think all human beings, if they stood outside society and had to make a choice about the way society should be run without a knowledge of where they will be in that society. So John Rawls' famous um, veil of ignorance. How would you build society if you didn't know where in that society you would be? I think you would choose um, uh, equality before the law. And I think you would also choose freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, a government that faces credible political opposition. I, I don't believe that these sorts of things are Western values. I think they're a good way to run human civilization. And going back to my first point, I think that we need to be more confident in stating that and less embarrassed by the idea that by being confident about promoting those ideas, we're somehow being imperialist. This is not the case. Okay, we're running out of time. Any final message to um, not only the broader audience, but to Ukrainians listening, what, what would you say to them? Well, needless to say, it's a great privilege to be here. And I believe that um, both scientifically and in, in the case of science and its wider political environment, of, of course, Ukraine has huge potential. It has a huge and uh, rich independent history that Ukrainians should continue to develop. And I think from my point of view, I'm very excited about uh, helping to work in the scientific fields that, that I know about, promoting collaborations with scientists internationally and promoting those collaborations within the context of a free thinking Ukraine. Charles Cockell, a uh, distinguished um, writer and a professor at Edinburgh. We are very happy that you've uh, graced us with your presence and uh, uh, we are inspired by you as a representative of the ongoing enlightenment that uh, scientists bring uh, to the rest of us, journalists in particular. Thank you for the symbiosis with, with the free press. Thank you very much, Bowden. It's a privilege to be back here in Kiev and in Ukraine. Thank you.